Congratulations on the new baby you're about to have. This is an exciting time, isn't it? And a little scary, too. It shouldn't be scary, but in our society, you never see anybody giving birth except yourself. So it's all new. Traditionally, from the earliest times and in many places in the world today, a young woman has witnessed birth among members of her family. We're going to talk about giving birth and about nurturing your infant, then your young child, in the ways that nature has determined will produce the strongest, most survivable human being. Isn't it strange that while the word natural is considered assurance of goodness, the ways of birth and nurturing of children have become wildly unnatural? We treat birth, the most elemental natural process in the world, as an illness or a technical problem and as a dire emergency. When we treat today's expectant mother as if she were ill, she tends to feel and act as if she were. Naturally, this makes pregnancy and birth more difficult. 24% of all births in the United States are by cesarean section. But beware also of any doctor who is going to rush your birth or labor with drugs, forceps, suction, or episiotomies. Shortening contractions with drugs can be dangerous. Rushing birth is almost always for the doctor's convenience only. Laying flat on your back is the worst position for giving birth and promotes complications. Walking around during labor helps move things along and reduces pain. The natural position is squatting. This position opens the pelvis wider and puts gravity to work. It's interesting, too, that other mammals and primitive people give birth privately. Strangers watching your labor probably slows down the process. When you're deciding where to have your baby, whether in a hospital or a birthing center, ask about their policies. May you walk about during labor? May you give birth in the squatting position? May you be director of this production? If not, Look for a hospital or birthing center that says yes. Remember that just because the hospital gives Lamaze classes does not necessarily mean that it treats birth as a natural function. Remember that you're the customer and should be in charge. You wouldn't let the staff of a hotel tell you what to do, would you? Many low-risk women choose to have their baby at home with the help of a midwife. An experienced midwife might be an excellent choice. The important things to think about in planning the birth of your baby are uh, the choice of your physician or midwife and the place where the baby will be born, which would be the hospital, the birth center, or the home. Uh, when you're looking at the care caretaker or provider, uh, you would go interview them first and ask them if they're willing to give you the type of birth that you really want whether in the case of the physician who's delivering in the hospital, you want to ask what hospital he uses, how often he does a C-section, how often he does an episiotomy, what it, how he feels about natural uh, childbirth, how he feels about breastfeeding, how he feels about any number of things that are important to you for your birth. Uh, the same goes for uh, the nurse midwife, uh, who more than likely will be meeting your needs a little bit better because she's more geared to that, but also the place where she would be delivering would govern a lot of those decisions. So uh, then you think about whether you want to have the baby in the hospital or whether you want to have the baby in the birth center at home. If you decide that you need the hospital or that's where you will be delivering, then you need to find out if they promote natural childbirth. If you can uh, have a uh, birthing room that is more like home, where your family can come in, where your husband will always be with you, where uh, you can uh, have your birth in a more natural way instead of being continuously on a monitor, having an IV as soon as you walk through the door, all of those things if you'll have the leeway of walking uh, during your labor, uh, if you can uh, take a shower, and then as the labor goes on, the different positions. Uh, it's uh, one of the most detrimental things that happens in the hospital is that the women lie down on their back and which causes a lot of problems with birth, actually, 
but also it's very uncomfortable for the woman in labor. And she can avoid a lot of the different um, uh, discomforts by being able to be in a position that her body is telling her that it is more comfortable. Uh, after the birth, the baby is whisked away. The thing that they can do instead of doing that is let the baby stay with the mother completely. Do the exam right there with her there and the father there. Uh, let the baby be there 24 hours a day with the mother in constant contact with the baby, which is optimum. I think that baby should be breastfed, that's for sure. They should be breastfed from the very moment they give birth, practically, within a few minutes. Because if they can start right away, then they breastfeed much more easily and, imagine, and latch on much more easily. Uh, the baby should always be with the mother. Uh, in bed is fine. I really think the baby should be there with her. And then if the baby wants to nurse, which very often is every one to two hours in that first few days, then the baby's right there, the mother doesn't have to get up, do anything except give them, uh, provide the breast. It bonds, it's wonderful, it's an attachment and a very special thing that uh, I don't think any woman that has given birth should miss. Well, it's just that. If, you, if there's some demand, if the baby nurses, the milk is there, the woman has let down, the milk comes. Uh, she can help that. She can help by drinking enough fluids. She can help by eating well, taking good care of herself, getting enough rest. But if the baby's nursing, he'll have, he, or, he, he or she will have enough. Uh, who suffers if the mother isn't taking care of herself is the mother. And so she, in addition to nurturing the baby, needs to nurture herself at that time. But if you choose a doctor, ask what percent of his or her patients have had C-sections. Compare his C-section rate with that of other doctors. Keep in mind that most women who have had a C-section are quite able to deliver vaginally, even women who have had C-sections before. Read about the birthing process, learn about the Bradley Method, and call the International Childbirth Association before you decide. If you do have your baby in the hospital, remember that it's your baby, not the doctor's or nurse's baby. Keep your baby with you at all times unless it has a serious medical problem. Be assertive. If enough people take charge of their baby, hospitals will change. Many hospitals have already responded to this movement. It seems so sad that after we carry our child as part of our body for nine months, most mothers maintain such physical separation after it's born. A study of our not-so-remote past shows that this is not the natural way. And because it's not the natural way, we must question whether this is a good way for the infant, the mother and father, the family, and our society as a whole. In the uterus, the unborn has heard and felt its mother's heartbeat every instant of its existence. It has enjoyed the complete fulfillment of its needs, a sense of rightness. How this sense of rightness must be shocked when the newborn is suddenly separated from its mother and denied even the warmth of its mother's skin to be kept warm by electrical devices. We should be very thoughtful about the fact that among many mammals, the mother abandons her young if they are separated from her at birth. Nature would have it that the newborn be immediately held by the mother, skin to skin at the breast. As for circumcision, the common insult to the male baby, it's nearly always an unnecessary act of cruelty. Even with the local anesthetic, the infant gives every indication of suffering pain. Circumcision is probably perceived by the baby as an attack from which it had expected its parents to protect him. Circumcision is not necessary. There are no medical indications for circumcision. The foreskin is there to keep the end of the penis warm and clean and moist. It has a function. To remove it without, an anesthe without anesthesia is indeed a cruel 
and inhumane practice. It has become a custom, and it is done more through custom than through medical indications. The, it is not a common procedure in uh, other modern developed countries. There are no other countries except for Israel that have the same rate of circumcision as the United States. Uh, other modern Western countries do not circumcise. It is important to leave the penis alone. Uh, this is a, a very important advice to all parents. Leave the penis alone. If your baby is intact, has his, then has his foreskin, do not attempt to retract it. Wait until the boy is old enough to learn how to keep, keep himself clean. Uh, this means that the foreskin does not have to be retracted the, uh, to be cleaned underneath it. Uh, the, the, as long as the baby is able to urinate okay, it is, it is, it is okay to just to leave it alone. You can hear the agonizing cry of a baby that has been circumcised, and you can identify this from the other reasons why the baby cries. You can certainly tell when he's hungry or, or when he's having a great deal of pain. And the circumcision is an, an indeed a very painful procedure, and it is not without complications. Many of the complications go un, unidentified, things like infection and bleeding and um, bad surgical results happened much more frequently than is reported. The sucking reflex seems the essential survival tool for the baby and young child. It calms and relaxes the child, helping it to sleep and better cope with stress. The newly born will nurse almost constantly at the beginning. Nursing is not only for food. The act helps to calm the baby who feeds also on the mother's presence and affection. Nursing in turn calms the mother as she senses the baby's dependence. Evidence suggests that consistent breastfeeding not only furnishes nutrition, but the continuous physical contact with the mother appears essential to vigorous growth of both body and spirit. Most nursing mothers nurse fully clothed babies while fully clothed. Skin-to-skin -skin contact is encouraged to increase the physical attachment so valuable in the mother-child relationship. Tune into the baby's need and let the baby suckle as it wishes. The baby will develop its own schedule. In the beginning, breasts may be a little sore. Don't be alarmed or discouraged. This should end by the time the baby is two weeks old. In the nursing process, the baby develops both a sense of confidence in the mother and a sense of his own power and control. Both are essential for development into a happy, loving human being. Nursing guards the health of the infant by providing antibodies which protect the baby against a number of diseases. This protection lasts for as long as nursing continues, no matter how old the child. The nursing process also releases hormones in the mother's body. These hormones are calming and promote strong feelings of attachment which benefit not only mother and baby, but the father and the baby's brothers and sisters. We know how a new baby often disrupts relationships within a family. Would a study show that the life of a family with a nursing mother suffers less disturbance than if the baby were bottle fed? We believe it would. How much is lost to everyone when a modern mother abandons this truly human, truly natural process and provides the baby merely nutrition? cow's milk, or worse, chemicals sucked through plastic. Aside from the differences in emotional development between breastfeeding and bottle feeding, no mother who understands the nutritional differences would choose the bottle. The presence and proportions of essential substances, including taurine, which is essential to brain development, in mother's milk are designed for the healthy growth and development of the human infant. Nature has designed cow's milk for calves. It's perfect for them. Breastfeed your baby whenever it wishes. Among mammals, the human infant is a short-spaced, on-demand feeder. This means that the human mother is intended to carry her baby wherever she goes and nurse it on demand. Nursing is a demand-driven business. The more your baby nurses, the more milk you will make. If your baby needs at least six diapers a day, you have enough milk. Research has shown that ape and monkey babies that are carried and fed on demand seldom or never vomit or burp. However, 
When they are reared by hand and fed on an artificial two-hour schedule, they frequently vomit, burp, or become colicky. development. You will see pamphlets about weaning. Check to see who publishes them. Many are produced by makers of baby formula or companies who front for them. These companies wish you to discontinue nursing and buy their products. Chimpanzees, our nearest genetic relatives, nurse their young for four years and chimp babies mature much more quickly than a human baby. Don't rush your baby ahead of its biological clock. It is interesting, and it might be important to some, that in several places the Bible indicates that babies are to breastfeed for three or more years. One example is in the second book of Maccabees, chapter 7, verse 27. When you look for a pediatrician, don't be afraid to interview several doctors. Choose the one who understands the child as a whole person with critical emotional and developmental needs, not just an assembly of body parts. Pediatricians don't study breastfeeding in medical school, so their advice usually derives from their own upbringing or what they do with their own children. If your doctor says, I hope he's not still nursing, or I hope he's not having more than so-and-so bottles a day, he's just expressing a personal opinion not related to medical practice. For help in choosing a pediatrician, call or write to the La Leche League or some other lactational consultants. They have lists of doctors in your area who have studied lactation after graduation from medical school. Now I have a little sign in my office that says early weaning not recommended for babies. It's a very individual decision and I tell mothers that as long as both of you enjoy breastfeeding, don't put a time limit on this beautiful relationship. When one member of the nursing pair is ready to stop, then you should stop. In my experience, the longer a baby is breastfed, the better physically and emotionally for the whole family. Mother and baby are one unit, and nursing beyond one year or two years it, uh, should be thought of as being a, a good thing. Uh, a baby, a toddler, a toddler uh, is sometimes very insecure. He has a lot of awareness of what's going on, but he doesn't always understand. When he has the consistency of the mother's breasts, then he, he is able to get the love and support that allows him to, to, uh, to develop into a, uh, a whole, strong person. It is uh, very important for his personality to feel loved and secure. Human milk is a very special fluid. There are thousands of ingredients in mother's milk. Some of these, or these ingredients, aren't found anywhere else in nature. The very unique composition of proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, minerals, and special things like immunoglobulins to help keep the baby free from infection. And babies should receive nothing but human milk for the first six months of his life. For the first year of his life, it, human milk should be two-thirds to three-quarters of his calories. If you, uh, mother, when mothers choose to nurse past a year of life, that, that, that's still a lot of benefits for the infant. Things like bonding and attachment are very important. Although our society accepts postpartum depression as a common sequel to childbirth, Postpartum depression is unknown in simpler societies where the mother carries the baby all the time and the baby is permitted to feed as it wishes. Here's what's been suggested as the cause of postpartum depression. After childbirth, the mother's hormones are balanced to promote and direct the care of both mother and infant. 
and this balance is maintained by nursing and handling the infant. If the mother fails to nurse or handle her baby enough, a resulting hormonal imbalance causes feelings of loss as if her baby is sick or has died. This grieving is postpartum depression. So, postpartum depression might be the result of behavior, and if so, cannot be viewed as a natural occurrence. Be sure to have extra patience with the older sibling when the new baby arrives. It's a very difficult time for the older child, who will probably act difficult for some time. Don't leave him out. Give him extra hugs and attention daily. But at the same time, don't forget the new baby's need for attachment and sucking. Long spacing between children does make things a lot easier. I am the mother of seven children, and this is a brief history of my parenting styles. Our first two babies were boys, and they were breastfed for about eight months. The parenting style we adopted with them was not attachment style parenting, but it was also not detachment. We did, however, leave these babies more than we believe now is good for a baby. By the time our third baby came along, also a boy, it was six years later than our second one. And by this time, we had a lot more information about parenting and breastfeeding. I was learning that it was good to extend the time of breastfeeding, and as a result, this baby was breastfed for 17 months. At this point, he was only nursing at bedtime, so the weaning was not a traumatic weaning, although now I believe it was still too early to wean this baby. Our fourth baby came along three years after the birth of our third one, and she, our first daughter, was also our first high-need baby. We had to learn a whole new style of parenting with her. She slept for the first six months in a bassinet right next to our bed, and so she slept fairly well at night, perhaps waking up once or twice. When she became too big for the bassinet, I moved her into a large baby crib and placed her crib across the room against the wall. This amount of separation was too much for her, and she began to wake at night every two hours and then every hour until finally I figured out that she needed to be sleeping closer to me and we began our experience with shared sleep. As soon as I took her into bed with me and kept her there for the night, she stopped waking up. She also needed a lot more sucking and her need for sucking was intense and prolonged. There is no way I would have weaned her as early as I did the first three babies. Fortunately for me, I did a lot of reading and research on breastfeeding, and we learned more about attachment parenting. I learned the value of long-term breastfeeding. By the time she was two years old, we were watching a different animal. She was showing compassion at the young age of 18 months. And by the time she was two, she had incredible nurturing skills. This was new to us, to see this in a baby so young. Then when she reached the ripe old age of three and a half, she decided that nursery, or Sunday school at this point in time, would be a great idea, and she waved goodbye to us and did great from that time on with separation. When our fifth baby came along, also a girl, we had all of the above repeated and made the same observations about the comparison of parenting style and the development of compassion and nurturing skills in the child. At that point, we thought, this is wonderful, but it's probably just because these last two babies have been girls and that we are seeing a gender difference. Then baby number six came along three years after baby number five. Lo and behold, we had another boy, and lo and behold, he showed the same traits as babies number four and five, the same compassion and nurturing skills. And now that we have baby number seven, who is 15 months old, we will be expecting to see the very same personality characteristics in this child because, of course, he is also receiving attachment parenting and will have extended breastfeeding. Just to clarify what I mean by extended breastfeeding, baby number four breastfed until she was about four years old. Baby number five breastfed until she was just short, two months short of her fourth birthday. And baby number six was three years, four months when he weaned. Baby number seven is, of course, still going. You 
We've seen that most mammals struggle to their feet just after birth and walk along with their mother an hour later. But humans are born in a state so immature it takes eight to ten months before the infant can even crawl. Yet in our society, parents and pediatricians leave the newborn to go it alone, sleeping first in a sterile plastic fishbowl, then in a crib in a room away from its mother. One study of 10 hunter-gatherer societies revealed that infants were held or carried throughout the day until they began to crawl. They are carried in a sling or fabric pouch in which they may mold their bodies to their mother's body. Contact is continuous throughout the day. By three or four years of age, these children enjoy spending more than half the day playing with their peers. Their mother is generally in view, always accessible to the child. This accessibility gives the child confidence and frees it to direct its energy toward learning about and responding to the world about it. The fear that the child may become dependent on its parents has been proven baseless and harmful. Isn't a creature who cannot move about or look after its most basic needs truly dependent? The child will continue to be dependent until it is able to take care of its basic needs. It is the parent's job to encourage independence, but only at the rate of the child's development. Hold your baby as much as possible. You're not going to spoil the baby who for nine months heard your every heartbeat and went everywhere with you. If baby cries, it's because it needs you for food or contact or to relieve its discomfort. It doesn't seem fair to ignore it. If you ignore your infant's cry for satisfaction, you are denying its feelings. Much of this cramps healthy emotional development and promotes a sense of helplessness that could haunt your child's entire life. Such a sense of helplessness and a vague sense of being not okay also could result if you respond to your infant's cry for satisfaction with negative attention. For the infant, there is no world or no reality except the mother. The mother is his power, possibility, and safety. When your infant is upset and reaches out his arms to be held, you should hold the child before he begins to cry. Imagine your anxiety if you felt unable to touch reality. The biological plan provides the infant exactly the sensory and motor skills and understanding needed for his state of development. Soon, the infant has the experience and ability to begin to move away from the mother and explore the world around him. The child is able to begin this exploration only if he feels absolutely certain of a safe place to return for comfort, reassurance, and encouragement. Given these things, your child can move into childhood with power and confidence. All children have needs which are special and unique, some more than others. All babies need love, nourishment, security, and patience. Mothering means meeting all of these needs as completely as possible. In spite of the changes which occur between infancy and toddlerhood, I have found that long-term breastfeeding has been the universal solution to nearly every developmental need and the cornerstone by which my own children's lives have begun. I am the mother of three beautiful children with needs as diversified as they are similar. Only the first is a birth child, while the others were adopted with special needs. Yet all have been nurtured at my breast, slept with both mommy and daddy at various times, and are intensely loved and wanted. Their needs have ranged from allergies, Down syndrome, heart surgery, common bumps and bruises, everyday fears and insecurities, and that an unavoidable concern over what goes bump in the night. Being nurtured at the breast, as well as nourished, has been their common cure-all. None of our children has ever developed an attachment to an object, as some do. Our little ones have always a security mommy rather than a blanket or toy. I have made myself available to my children in every way and every hour of every day. It is my hope that this very secure beginning I've attempted to give them will carry over into their adolescence and adulthood. They carry with them their parents' love and devotion, and that is the very best foundation we can give them. As you hear these words, you may feel uncomfortable, sad, or angry. This could mean that you did not receive this kind of unconditional love and reassurance from your mother or father. If this was so, almost certainly your mother or father experienced the same loss. Negative nurturing promotes weakness and unhappiness and seems to be passed down through generations. It's nobody's fault and there's no sense blaming. Your self-awareness can end this cycle before your child assumes the burden of insecurity and unhappiness. Professional counseling will arouse this self-awareness. 
Our culture does not encourage much physical connection between mother and child after separation of their bodies at birth. Unlike primitive mothers and many mothers in developed societies, American mothers generally do not recognize the baby's need or their own for close body contact. Instead of responding to her natural yearning for closeness to her baby, the mother often shows maternal attachment only in response to the child's screaming and kinesthetic demands. The father has a vital place in the baby's tactile life, too. It's good for the father to bathe his infant and to dry and dress it. It's good for him to change the baby and carry and rock and play with it. The child needs him as an example of love and patience. Recent studies show that tribal women comfort their babies at the first sign of discomfort. Their babies cry less than half as much as ours, and then seldom cry more than a whimper. From these babies, you seldom hear the screaming cry we hear when the soft whimper has been denied. If parents need a bottom line to encourage them to cuddle their baby a lot, they need to know that babies who have been carried and handled cry much less and seem to develop higher IQs. In a series of papers in human nature, Pomona College anthropologist James J. McKenna has noted that rates of sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, tend to be lower in cultures where co-sleeping is common. The SIDS rate in the United States is several times that in Sweden, Israel, and Japan, where co-sleeping is the norm. In a related paper, McKenna described his research supporting findings that infant primates separated from their mothers showed stress, despair, an abnormally low heart rate, and lowered levels of protective antibodies. I use the term sharing sleep, which simply means that a baby and a mother and father in bed. And usually what works best is for a baby to sleep right next to the mother, between, a, between mother and a guardrail, or between mother and the wall, instead of between mom and dad. That works much better. Now the benefits of sharing sleep, first of all, it makes it much easier for the mother, especially the breast, breastfeeding mother, because when baby wakes up, all mother does is roll over and nurse baby and the, the pair drift back to sleep. If baby is in another room, by the time baby cries and wakes mother up, by the time mother gets down to baby, baby's wide awake and mother's wide awake and they're both angry and it takes them longer to resettle. But if mothers and baby are clo in close nursing distance to one another, mother just rolls over, nurses baby before baby completely awakens, and mother completely awakens, and the nursing pair drift back to sleep without either one fully awakening. I think the extra touch time, especially in our society where you have busy lifestyles, many mothers are away from their babies during the day. So being away from the baby at day, uh, during the day means that they ought to sleep with their babies at night. So what the baby didn't get for touch time during the day, they get at night. I think the physical and emotional benefits of that nighttime touch is just wonderful. Family is one unit. Sleeping with the baby allows the baby to be attached and bonded. Uh, it, it allows the baby to develop a very close relationship with his uh, parents. Of course, it allows the parents to be responsive to the baby's uh, needs. When the baby cries, parents should respond to their baby. Babies uh, uh, have a lot of reasons why they might awake during the middle of the night. Uh, sometimes they're uh, hungry, sometimes they're thirsty, sometimes uh, they have dreams. You can see babies dream uh, when you watch them, uh, watch their eyes with REM sleep. And uh, the message that we want to give babies is that uh, we respond to them. We don't want to give babies that they should just lie in their cribs and cry and try to work out their own problems. Well, schedules simply don't work with breastfeeding. Babies have their own biological time clock. It's, uh, it's uh, true that babies, a newborn baby, 
will want to nurse 10, 12, 14, sometimes 16 times a day. That same baby could be four or five months old and nursing four or five times a day. He will adjust to a schedule without anybody forcing him, forcing one on him. He has his own time clock to do this. Uh, it is not a good idea to let babies cry just because it's not time to feed them. They usually learn it first times from their wives when they have babies, or if they are a woman pediatrician, they learn it when they nurse their own babies. You don't get taught that in medical school. Uh, I think most pediatricians now are getting away from that because mothers are coming to them much more informed. They have been through the Leche League meetings, they have read the Leche League books, they have uh, talked to lactation specialists, they have t attended breastfeeding classes. So you'll probably find that today's mother having a baby is, is probably better informed about breastfeeding than her doctor. Remember, books are, are written to sell. And the quick and easy advice sells. If you give mom a recipe that says, let your baby cry one hour the first night, 50 minutes the second night, 40 minutes the third night, and by the end of the week they'll be sleeping. Or you go in 5.5 minutes and all that stuff. Parents like that. They like the quick and easy advice. They like formulas. I've learned in 20 years in pediatric practice and parenting seven children that difficult solutions, difficult problems do not have easy solutions. And the current books that say let them cry it out, that, that advice has been around. It was first published in 1894. It's nothing new. And the reason it's popular is because it's quick, it's easy, it requires no thought, and uh, it's, it, it apparently works in the short term. I think in the long run, it causes a distance between mother and baby. It causes a bit of anger in baby. And what I do tell mothers, if, if your baby is crying and you feel bad about it, and it's not working for you, and it's turning you inside out, then go by all means, go in and pick up your baby. A book can't tell you what to do on that. The message you want to give to your children as parents is that if they have a problem, you're going to try to solve it for them. You can't always solve it, but you're always going to try to solve it. Now, you don't want to give the message that you have a problem, uh, don't bother calling me. You just lie in your crib and work it out. When they grow up, they, they remember this message. And if they have a problem, why bother calling my parents? They never respond to me. That's not the message responsible parents want to give to their children. You want to give the message that you are always there for your children, that you are always try to help them. There are different cries, and the sooner you get to a baby, the easier that baby will be consoled. If, if you can console a baby early on, as soon as that the opening cue, they're much easier to settle. Once a baby's cry escalates into a wail, then they're much more difficult to settle. But every night, most American kids are carefully prepared for a night of loneliness. Separated from their mothers to lie alone without human warmth and comfort, they tense their bodies and restrict their breath to shut out the anxiety. The co-sleeping baby sleeps more soundly and awakens to the presence of others to hug and love him. This contrasts with the awaking of a baby alone in a lifeless room. And remember that when baby sleeps better, so do its parents. The parenting style that we've chosen for our family seems very natural to me. It's not something that took a lot of effort to become adjusted to. As a fireman and paramedic, I have a lot of sleepless nights at work, and it's important when I am home to get a good night's sleep. That's never been a problem because since the day our daughter was born, she slept in our bed. When it was time for bed, my wife would nurse Natalie to sleep. Every few hours or so after that, if she wanted to nurse for nourishment or comfort, she would quietly snuggle up to my wife and nurse. There was never loud crying in the middle of the night, and the bedroom lights never had to be turned on. Everyone slept warm and comfortably in our warm family bed. It was also a lot nicer to wake up to a smiling, happy face rather than a crying infant in another bedroom down the hall. Now our daughter sometimes does go to sleep on her own without nursing. 
But it's nice to know that my wife hasn't forced her to stop when she still has a need for it. She's not afraid of the dark, nor does she have negative feelings about sleeping. She now sleeps through the night. This was never cruelly forced upon her, but was rather part of her natural development. We still have the benefit of her smiling face in the morning, and I feel very bonded to my wife and my daughter. We know when she's ready to sleep in her own bed on her own, she'll let us know. Since we had our daughter two and a half years ago, I realized what an anti-child society we live in. If anyone had told me three years ago that I'd be nursing a toddler and sleeping with my baby and generally not feeling right about being separated from her, I would have thought they were crazy. What happened was, was that I began to listen to my instincts and my motherly intuition. This was easier for me than for many because I had already gone against our cultural norms when I had a beautiful planned home birth. Our daughter was ours from the beginning. She was not separated from us after birth, and breastfeeding was begun immediately and exclusively. This helped establish our strong bond, and this in turn helped me to develop and trust my mothering instincts, since there was no interference from outside sources. I often think of other mammals and how they abandon their offspring if separation occurs after birth. In our Western culture, we are actually encouraged to leave our babies in the nursery at night so mothers can get their rest. We are told to start giving our babies bottles of milk so that we can leave our newborns in the care of others and easily get away from our baby for the weekend. Those of us who deep down do not feel right about this unnatural type of separation are told by most experts and lay people alike that we will spoil our children if we answer their cries, keep them in our beds at night, and refuse to be separated for any frivolous or self-indulgent reason. My husband and I were both able to turn a deaf ear to all those recommendations. We were able to turn inside ourselves and parent from our hearts and instincts. The result has been an incredibly independent, happy, normal, and outgoing two and a half year old. She's also been extremely healthy physically, which I contribute to her having a strong emotional health and the benefit of long term, in our culture anyway, nursing. I am definitely not claiming to have all the answers. I would just like to encourage parents to listen to their hearts and know that it is okay to ignore all of the negative, anti-family, anti-child attitudes and advice. My goal is to raise a healthy, happy human being who knows she is an important person. I am hoping that I have established in her a trust in me as her mother, so that as she lear learns more about our world and its dangers, she will trust that, I, that what I have to say about drugs, alcohol, etc. is true. I'm hoping that parenting through the difficult years ahead will be easier because of the relationship we've already established and hope to continue. We are joyously awaiting the birth of our second child, and as I look back on the last two and a half years of parenting Natalie, I realize that I do not want to change a thing. Our new baby and our intuition will be our guide. There are many products on the market that claim to make life easier for the family. There are baby monitors so that parents can hear their babies cry while they sleep in separate rooms. There are even teddy bears that simulate the sound of the human heart so that the baby can be comforted by a stuffed animal. We need to ask ourselves what messages these products are giving us. What does the baby really need? I think that once parents realize that it's okay to turn inside themselves and listen to their hearts, then the answers will be clear. Again, co-sleeping is as common today in some progressive industrial countries as it always has been among so-called primitive societies. Young children may sleep in the same bed with their parents or, when older, with their older siblings. Children who have slept with their parents during their first years become more firmly bonded with them and even seem to reach independence more willingly than children who are frightened and forced into separation. Your baby need not be protected from ordinary household noises as she sleeps and may usually be moved about without waking. She became quite used to moving about in her active mother's womb. Quieting the household so your baby can sleep creates an unnatural environment that may stimulate more anxiety than sleep. And again, you should be with your baby as she awakens. She will learn to trust and will fall asleep more easily knowing you will be there when she awakens. Most babies are ready to eat solid foods at six to eight months. The baby should, of course, continue nursing. Do not force or pressure a baby to eat anything, now or ever. Early eating problems are nearly always caused by negative or mixed signals about food and eating. Mealtime is the worst time for a power struggle. There will be foods your baby will not like until much older, and there are times when she will simply not be hungry. A well baby knows what it needs. 
For older toddlers who wish to drink something other than breast milk, water is the most healthy thirst quencher. Most children will become hyperactive and cranky after any soda and after too much of other sweets. Chocolate and soda, certainly sodas having caffeine and sugar, have no place in a young child's diet. Just a little of either may swing the child into intense hyperactivity in which he cannot respond to you, followed by a downward swing to a miserable and cranky mood. Permit any sweets only in moderation. Sodas, especially those containing caffeine and chocolate which contains natural caffeine, appear to create a desire for more. Remember that children learn more by our example than by our preaching. It's smart and helpful to practice what we preach or at least to indulge ourselves away from their ever-learning eyes. It's a matter both of education and courtesy. Presently I'm nursing my daughter who's 21 months old and my son who's four years old and we've experienced many benefits through nursing beyond infancy. The greatest benefit to me has been the feeling of being connected to the child through long-term breastfeeding. Each day that we experience as a nursing couple is another day that the bonding between us grows. Although I was raised in a dysfunctional family, I see the nursing relationship as a real functional family model. The long breastfeeding period has afforded me the time to learn how to parent in a more sensible manner. Breastfeeding has helped me to control my temper by keeping me in touch with my child. On the practical side, I always felt that my child had adequate nutrition through breastfeeding, even during times of low appetite for solids. I took pride in looking at my growing child and knowing that my breast milk was still helping that growth. My children have been healthy because of the benefits of my breast milk, and my own diet has been more nutritionally sound. I have a good feeling about the health and nutrition of my family. I feel that extended breastfeeding has forced me to focus on my role as a mother and a nurturer, and I feel that by extended breastfeeding, I've really experienced motherhood to the fullest extent. And I feel that my children, by being nursed past infancy, have been able to experience their childhood to the fullest extent. First, remember that a struggle between you and your toddler is never a fair match, so don't get into that mode. Discipline means teaching. You cannot teach in anger or in a spiteful spirit. Can an out-of-control parent teach a child to control its behavior? Our kids that are raised in a home where they strike first and ask questions later uh, usually grow up to be the kind of teenagers that strike first and ask questions later. Uh, their home is just set with a tone of, of aggression and um, physical anger, impulsive anger and striking out. Um, there's been many studies done in prisons and among prostitutes and in uh, drug rehab centers that say that an, an extremely high percentage in prisons between 95 and 100 percent of all prisoners report some type of um, abuse in their childhood, um, which makes sense in that if you're not getting positive messages, you don't end up making real positive choices in your adult life. So there's real severe consequences for regular ongoing abusive behavior to children. I think um, it's the easiest way. It's uh, impulsive and it, it, it uh, satisfies your anger and it, it does a lot for you personally and it's much easier. No, I don't believe it's the best way. I think um, that it communicates distance and aggression and um, and there's much better ways to communicate to a child what their boundaries are than spanking. My feeling is that a lot of supervision, especially with young children, uh, it takes a lot of work, but to always be there to be aware of what they might be getting into, to remove those things that are potential issues such as um, curling irons or stereos or, or uh, unsupervised access to streets or, or, or behind cars. 
takes a little bit more work to be there. If, um, if you have a young child who does get into something and they're too young to really conceptually understand, um, it's important to, um, to provide distractions, whether it's moving them quickly to something else they may be interested in, is a much better response to children's, um, children's curiosity, which is normal. Um, so with young children, I think it's really important to just provide a distraction from whatever it is that they're not, they're not supposed to be playing with or touching or doing. ahead of time, I think one thing that works best is positive reinforcement before the behavior s starts or when there's a warning that, for instance, school problems may occur. To set up, um, I've seen parents set up charts where um, they get stars each day for making their bed, for brushing their teeth, for not fighting with their sister, and the, and the stars add up to something tangible. So at the end of the week there's a, a Chuck E. Cheese or a McDonald's or whatever it is the child enjoys. Positive reinforcement is much, much, um, kids respond to that more so than waiting till it's a disaster and then getting the negative attention. It sets them up for um, desiring positive attention and learning how to work towards that. Make sure that the punishment fits the crime. For instance, um, the situation of a child uh, irresponsibly playing baseball in a place where the ball breaks a window of a neighbor as opposed to grabbing them and spanking them or um, or yelling them out and hum yelling at them, humiliating in front of friends, a good idea would be to have them uh, take the time to earn the money to pay for the window, whatever that may, whatever chores that may mean. The kids get a sense of responsibility and, and money management, and it fits the, the crime, so to speak, of, um, that got them in trouble in the first place. Lots of messages. I think not only in uh, what you say verbally to them, dramatically forms their self-esteem and their sense of self um, throughout childhood and adulthood. Um, what messages you communicate to them by the, time, the, the amount of time you spend with them, the quality of time, the interest in, um, in, in their life that you take, the daily, their school, their, um, their interests, their stories, their fears. Time is, quality time is real important in addition to quantity time with kids. They need to hear um, how important they are to you. They need to hear how worthwhile they are. Positive messages, praise for whatever it is you see. Find something often in your children to, to praise them for. That's really important for kids to hear. Have a respect for children's opinions, a respect for their feelings, not to negate um, any feelings or opinions as silly. I think there's a strong message in just listening to kids, just being heard, just being listened to as opposed to constantly being talked at. It's real important to kids. It, it builds their self-esteem. Uh, one of the things I see a lot in, um, in abusive families or emotionally neglectful families is role reversal, where the child becomes the parent of the child, and the child is raised to meet the needs of the parent. And that can be really subtle to slip into. But be sure that um, you're there to meet the needs of the child as opposed to um, that child seeing, being seen as, um, as there to make you happier, to fulfill your expectations. That's important for healthy children is to know who's the child and who's the parent. Kids need to know you care. They're very sensing, especially young children. They know, um, they know when you need it. They know when you care. They need affection dramatically. Um, be free with it. And um, be sure to give kids as much as you can. It's important to teach kids, especially young kids, that they have a sense of privacy and it is okay for them to say no. And if they're uncomfortable by the way someone's touching them, talking to them, um, approaching them, it's okay for them to say no even if that person is an adult, even if it's an adult that they know or are related to. So it's good to teach children real early what their private parts are, be open with that issue, be open with um, and comfortable with um, sexuality with kids or um, identification of genitals is real important for kids to feel comfortable about. Have an open communication and let them know that it's okay for them to tell you. 
and that you, you will protect them no matter what anyone says. It's important for them to tell you. Um, and to spend some time teaching kids just general safety. If a, um, go through some role plays with kids on, on if a stranger comes up and asks you to um, have some candy to take you to the store to help them find their dog. Role play with kids what they do in that situation. Teach them how to do it, just as you would teach them if, what to do if there's a fire. Teach them what to do if there isn't a threat, a, a threat from adults, strangers, or, or relatives. Toilet training is a big issue. I think um, parents need to look at their own motivations, their own issues. Is, is their child's development a reflection on their positive parenting? Um, and sometimes you see some of that conflict that if my child's not toilet trained by two, there must be something wrong with me. Children have their own schedules. They have their own agendas. Um, let, I think it becomes sometimes a power struggle or a control struggle, and, you, and you're going to lose because the two-year-old's got a strong will. Um, let the child tell you when they're ready. Um, buy them a special tiny potty. Uh, make it a special event. Show them when the big brother or the big sister goes and, and kind of a rite of passage. But if they're not ready, they're not ready. And it isn't something that you can... Um, it, it's important not to make the children feel ashamed or behind or spanking for bedwetting. Um, give them the space and they'll do it when they're ready. Children are born sensitive and frightened. Their character as adolescents and as grown men and women, whether they are kind and empathetic or callous and resentful, depends very much on the self-image projected on them by their parents. Parents who find themselves hurting their children with unkind and vindictive words and actions should seek professional counseling with no excuses for delay. Counseling should reveal the root of the problem and bring peace to the parent and to the family. Children are naturally impulsive and inclined to follow their impulses in spite of your no-nos. Children cannot learn society's and nature's rules all at once, but only day by day. You must be patient while they learn by experience and your example, and perhaps just the tiniest bit of your no-nos. Try to save your no-nos for only the most important things. Certainly, violence is never appropriate. A child learns nothing but fear and resentment from violence, a fact proven by the fact that 95% of violent prisoners were abused sexually, physically, or emotionally as children. This makes child abuse everybody's business. You should report anyone you see abusing a child. It's strange indeed that some people will report one adult striking another or abusing an animal, but feel unable to report an adult striking a helpless child. You want a loving person uh, to take care of your children, child. You don't want anybody that would prop up a bottle, for instance. Uh, babies should always be held whenever they're fed. And the person, most of all, should be loving and responsive, not allowing your baby to cry out his problems. Traveling the world, you would find that babies and children in most countries have a privileged place in the family and are not left out of their parents' lives. The adult does not seek personal pleasure at the expense of the child. In our country, children seem to receive no such respect. For example, diners in a restaurant will scowl and shake their heads at a child making funny noises, as if the child had no place there, as if the child should act other than a child. Tantrums, or mood swings, in a toddler or very young child may be caused by a number of things related to food, emotional needs, or fatigue. Try to learn the cause. Although the fit is usually triggered by a particular frustration or conflict, there is an underlying cause. Perhaps the child has been overstimulated or fatigued. This often happens when the child has been playing with older kids. There might have been too many sweets or withdrawal from the effects of yesterday's sweets. 
Or the little one might feel neglected and need to be held and cuddled or might need to be nursed. It is up to you to stay calm and rational and wait for this stage to pass. Certainly, punishing or yelling at the child only worsens the stress that is the cause of the problem. Do you remember how slowly time passed when you were a child? Do you remember how long it took Christmas or your birthday to come, or how long five minutes were when you had to sit still? An infant awake and alone cannot reassure himself that it will soon be 7 a.m. when his mother will come and he will be held and spoken to and changed. The infant has not learned any conception of time. There is only this interminable moment. Remember this when your baby seems impatient. Try to view the world through your child's eyes. A child's self-centeredness is not a character fault. To the child, it's the only defense against this strange and scary world. Be grateful for a child who challenges. She is learning that she is a somebody, that through her actions she can have her needs satisfied. At first, the child is simply not smart about how to do this. She must learn what works and what does not. If you can harmlessly satisfy her expressed need, you've helped her learn her power to take care of herself. The bottom line is to always respect your child's feelings, even when your child is not listening to you. You're the adult and must maintain your self-control, but don't expect your child to always be able to. Don't expect self-control from a child younger than three, and then only a little at a time. Practice your self-control. Teach by example and kindness. Choose discipline according to the child's level of development. You might discipline an older child by denying an evening of television. But always enforce discipline in a loving and thoughtful manner, never appearing to withhold your love even for a moment. The child who feels unconditionally loved today will find it easy to give love to others throughout his life. And of course, hitting your child results only in wounding of the spirit and resentment, perhaps permanently crippling. You can get more ideas for useful discipline from the National Committee for Prevention of Child Abuse. In dealing with your children, as in dealing with other grown-ups, a sense of humor will make the task easier or even possible. Never, never laugh at your child, but laugh with him. A sense of humor is a valuable gift. Having fun is great, and our society makes much of it. But fun is not always the same as happiness. Happiness is contentment in knowing that you are loved. Frantic fun-seeking is usually an effort to distract ourselves from our feelings of isolation and lovelessness. You've seen books and pamphlets and articles by every sort of advocate of another off-the-wall child-raising theory. Use your good instincts, good sense, and experience. Most important, put yourself in the child's place and let yourself feel his feelings about this. I'm the mother of four children who we've been educating at home. We find this both successful and rewarding. When the first was born ten years ago, I parented by the seat of my pants. I learned as much as did my daughter as we both grew up. Another daughter was born three years later. I had begun to realize that something was missing in our family life, but as yet did not know what was bothering me about our style of raising our children. Then I was pregnant again. As I searched out information on childbirth preparation classes, I came across information about a support group for breastfeeding moms. I was interested in what I heard and attended a meeting. This was a group of moms practicing attachment parenting. They treated their children with respect and love and interest. They acted this way with their children. I saw it in action. It was beautiful to see and inspiring. I tried it. It was a very nice way to parent a child. Our third girl and our fourth child, a son, have been raised this way from the beginning. We have learned to recognize their needs, no matter how inconvenient they may be, like at night. To respond to their needs is different than giving them anything they want. It means you recognize them as individuals with strong emotions, real feelings, and as great a need as our own for respect, understanding, affection, and guidance. As my husband and I live our own lives, we include our children. We place value in their inherent desire to develop themselves, to be part of the world, to identify with other people, and to allow their individuality its fullest measure. 
The techniques we've presented have been used for thousands of years and are standard in most places in the world. It's the original and natural way of child raising. Investigate rates of crime, violence, drug use, and youth suicide relative to the societal norm of child raising. See for yourself that there must be a better way than our present norm, which is a casual, neglectful, and even selfish way. Your child deserves and demands unconditional love. Your child grows with abundant emotional and physical contact and continual affirmation. Will your child grow up with a powerful and gentle spirit, a person with the inner strength and freedom to become the best kind of human being? Much depends on you.